Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we're going to return to Orison Sweat Marden. Check out my previous episodes. I've read several wonderful chapters from different books by Orison Sweat Marden that have inspired me immensely, and I've received so many wonderful letters and notes about these readings. They are on the same level as Neville Goddard. Absolutely. Period. 100%. These readings have such great motivational value and have taught me so much. How to get what you want is one I recommend. For those who are discouraged is great if you're struggling. The chapter on how to live in the here and now was a wonderful reminder of the present moment. One of the things I've talked about in my podcast a lot and I return to regularly is the advantage method. The idea is if you're struggling right now, if you're facing obstacles on your journey, then it's the way you face them that changes your future. Check out my meditation. Everything is working to your advantage. The idea around this is that you are being shaped and crafted perfectly. And if you're facing obstacles, you look at them as advantages because they become very useful to your future. Go and look at incredibly rich men or women and their children. And the children rarely do very well because they don't face the obstacles that are needed that shape their future. I know that I'm speaking to someone out there that is facing a really tough obstacle. And it's going to help you to understand that what you're facing right now is a wonderful thing and it will change your life. When I look back over my life, any major obstacles I've faced have always ended up being to my benefit and advantage. This chapter from a book called Rising in the World by Orison Sweat Marden, Architects of Fate, is a wonderful collection of analysis on why obstacles can be very useful in shaping and crafting who you are and what you want to do. Uses of Obstacles by Orison Sweat Marden. Nature, when she adds difficulties, adds brains. Emerson. Many men owe the grandeur of their lives to their tremendous difficulties. Spurgeon. The good are better made by ill, as odors crushed are sweeter still. Rogers. Aromatic plants bestow no spicy fragrance while they grow, but crushed or trodden to the ground diffuse their balmy sweets around. Goldsmith. As night to stars, woe luster gives to man young. There is no possible success without some opposition as a fulcrum. Force is always aggressive and crowds something. Holmes. The more difficulties one has to encounter within and without, the more significant and the higher in inspiration his life will be. Horace Bushnell. Adversity has the effect of eliciting talents which in prosperous circumstances would have lain dormant. Horace. For gold is tried in the fire an acceptable men in the furnace of adversity, Sirach. Though losses and crosses be lessons right severe, there's a wit there, you'll get there, you'll find no other where. Burns. Possession pampers the mind. Privation trains and strengthens it. Hazlitt. Adversity is the prosperity of the great. No man ever worked his way in a dead calm. John Neal. Kites rise against, not with, the wind. Many, and many a time since, said Harriet Martineau, referring to her father's failure in business, have we said that but for that loss of money, we might have lived on in the ordinary provincial method of ladies with small means, sewing and economizing and growing narrower every year. Whereas by being thrown, while it was yet time, on our own resources, we have worked hard and usefully, won friends, reputation, and independence, seen the world abundantly abroad and at home. 
in short, have truly lived instead of vegetating. I do believe God wanted a grand poem of that man, said George MacDonald of Milton, and so blinded him that he might be able to write it. Two of the three greatest epic poets of the world were blind, Homer and Milton, while the third, Dante, was in his later years nearly, if not altogether, blind. It almost seems as though some great characters had been physically crippled in certain respects so that they would not dissipate their energy, but concentrate it all in one direction. I have been beaten but not cast down, said Tears, after making a complete failure of his first speech in the Chamber of Deputies. I am making my first essay in arms, in the Tribune, as under fire. A defeat is as useful as a victory. A distinguished investigator in science said that when he encountered an apparently insuperable obstacle, he usually found himself upon the brink of some discovery. Returned with thanks has made many an author. Failure often leads a man to success by arousing his latent energy, by firing a dormant purpose, by awakening powers which were sleeping. Men of metal turn disappointments into helps as the oyster turns into pearl, the sand which annoys it. Let the adverse breath of criticism be to you only what the blast of the storm wind is to the eagle, a force against him that lifts him higher. A kite would not fly unless it had a string tying it down. It is just so in life. The man who is tied down by half a dozen blooming responsibilities and their mother will make a higher and stronger flight than the bachelor who, having nothing to keep him steady, is always floundering in the mud. If you want to ascend in the world, tie yourself to somebody. It was the severe preparation for the subsequent harvest, said Pemberton Lee. The eminent English lawyer speaking of his early poverty and hard work. I learned to consider indefatigable labor as the indispensable condition of success, pecuniary independence as essential alike to virtue and happiness, and no sacrifice too great to avoid the misery of debt. When Napoleon's companions made sport of him on account of his humble origin, and poverty, he devoted himself entirely to books, and soon rising above them in scholarship, commanded their respect. Soon he was regarded as the brightest ornament of the class. To make his way at the bar, said an eminent jurist, a young man must live like a hermit and work like a horse. There is nothing that does a young lawyer so much good as to be half-starved. Thousands of men of great native ability have been lost to the world because they have not had to wrestle with obstacles and to struggle under difficulties sufficient to stimulate into activity their dormant powers. No effort is too dear which helps us along the line of our proper career. Poverty and obscurity of origin may impede our progress, but it is only like the obstruction of ice or debris in the river temporarily forcing the water into eddies, where it accumulates strength and a mighty reserve which ultimately sweeps the obstruction impetuously to the sea. Poverty and obscurity are not insurmountable obstacles, but they often act as a stimulus to the naturally indolent and develop a firmer fiber of mind, a stronger muscle and stamina of body. If the germ of the seed has to struggle to push its way up through the stones and hard sod, to fight its way up to the sunlight and air, and then to wrestle with storm and tempest, with snow and frost, the fiber of its timber will be all the tougher and stronger. Do you wish to live without a trial? asks a modern teacher. Then you wish to die but half a man. Without a trial, you cannot guess at your own strength. Men do not learn to swim on a table. They must go into deep water and buffet the waves. Hardship is the native soil of manhood and self-reliance. Trials are rough teachers, but rugged schoolmasters make rugged pupils. 
a man who goes through life prosperous and comes to his grave without a wrinkle is not half a man. Difficulties are God's errands, and when we are sent upon them, we should esteem it a proof of God's confidence. We should reach after the highest good. If you wish to rise, said Talleyrand, make enemies. There is good philosophy in the injunction to love our enemies, for they are often our best friends in disguise. They tell us the truth when friends flatter. Their biting sarcasm and scathing rebuke are often mirrors which reveal us to ourselves. These unkind stings and thrusts are spurs which urge us on to grander success and noble endeavor. Friends cover our faults and rarely rebuke. Enemies drag out to the light all our weakness without mercy. We dread these thrusts and exposures as we do the surgeon's knife, but are the better for them. They reach depths before untouched, and we are led to resolve to redeem ourselves from scorn and inferiority. We are the victors of our opponents. They have developed in us the very power by which we overcome them. Without their opposition, we could never have braced and anchored and fortified ourselves as the oak is braced and anchored for its thousand battles with the tempests. Our trials, our sorrows, and our griefs develop us in a similar way. The man who has triumphed over difficulties bears the sign of victory in his face. An air of triumph is seen in every movement. John Calvin, who made a theology for the 17th and 18th centuries, was tortured with disease for many years, and so was Robert Hall. The great men who have lifted the world to a higher level were not developed in easy circumstances, but were rocked in the cradle of difficulties and pillowed on the hardships. The gods look on no grander sight than an honest man struggling with adversity. Then I must learn to sing better, said Anaximander, when told that the very boys laughed at his singing. Strong characters, like the palm tree, seem to thrive best when most abused. Men who have stood up bravely under great misfortune for years are often unable to bear prosperity. Their good fortune takes the spring out of their energy, as the torrid zone enervates race accustomed to a vigorous climate. Some people never come to themselves until baffled, rebuffed, thwarted, defeated, crushed in the opinion of those around them. Trials unlock their virtues. Defeat is the threshold of their victory. It is defeat that turns bone to flint. It is defeat that turns gristle to muscle. It is defeat that makes men invincible. It is defeat that has made those heroic natures that are now in the ascendancy and that has given the sweet law of liberty instead of the bitter law of oppression. Difficulties call out great qualities and make greatness possible. How many centuries of peace would have developed a grant? Few knew Lincoln until the great weight of the war showed his character. A century of peace would never have produced a Bismarck. Perhaps Phillips and Garrison would never have been known to history had it not been for slavery. Will he not make a great painter? was asked in regard to an artist fresh from his Italian tour. No, never, replied Northcott. Why not? Because he has an income of 6,000 pounds a year. In the sunshine of wealth, a man, as a rule, warped too much to become an artist of high merit. A drenching shower of adversity would strengthen his fibers out again. He should have some great thwarting difficulty to struggle against. The best tools receive their temper from fire, their edge from grinding. The noblest characters are developed in a similar way. The harder the diamond, the more brilliant the luster, and the greater the friction necessary to bring it out. Only its own dust is hard enough to make this most precious stone reveal its full beauty. The spark in the flint would sleep forever, but for friction. The fire in man would never blaze, but for antagonism. The friction, which retards a train upon the track, 
robbing the engine of a fourth of its power is the very secret of locomotion. Oil the track, remove the friction, and the train will not move an inch. The moment man is relieved of opposition or friction, and the track of his life is oiled with inherited wealth or other aids, that moment he often ceases to struggle and therefore ceases to grow. It is this scantiness of means, this continual deficiency, this constant hitch, this perpetual struggle to keep the head above water and the wolf from the door that keeps society from falling to pieces. Let every man have a few more dollars than he wants and anarchy would follow. Suddenly with much jarring and jolting, an electric car came to a standstill just in front of a heavy truck that was headed in an opposite direction. The huge truck wheels were sliding uselessly around on the car tracks that were wet and slippery from rain. All the urging of the teamster and the straining of the horses were in vain, until the motorman quietly tossed a shovel full of sand on the track under the heavy wheels and then the track lumbered on its way. Friction is a very good thing, remarked a passenger. The philosopher Kant observes that a dove, inasmuch as the only obstacle it has to overcome is the resistance of the air, might suppose that if only the air were out of the way, it could fly with greater rapidity and ease. Yet, if the air were withdrawn and the bird should try to fly in a vacuum, it would fall instantly to the ground, unable to fly at all. The very element that offers the opposition to flying is at the same time the condition of any flight whatever. Rough seas and storms make sailors. Emergencies make giant men. But for our civil war, the names of its grand heroes would not be written among the greatest of our time. This effort or struggle to climb to a higher place in life has strengthened and dignity in it and cannot fail to leave us stronger for the struggle even though we miss the prize. From an aimless, idle, and useless brain, emergencies often call out powers and virtues before unknown and unsuspected. How often we see a young man develop astounding ability and energy after the death of a parent or the loss of a fortune, or after some other calamity has knocked the props and crutches from under him. The prison has roused the slumbering fire in many a noble mind. Robinson Crusoe was written in prison. The Pilgrim's Progress appeared in Bedford Jail. The Life and Times of Baxter, Eliot's Monarchia of Man, and Penn's No Cross, No Crown were written by prisoners. Sir Walter Raleigh wrote the history of the world during his imprisonment of thirteen years. Luther translated the Bible while confined in the castle of Wartburg. For twenty years Dante worked in exile, and even under sentence of death. His works were burned in public after his death, but genius will not burn. Take two acorns from the same tree as nearly alike as possible. Plant one on a hill by itself and the other in the dense forest and watch them grow. The oak standing alone is exposed to every storm. Its roots reach out in every direction, clutching the rocks and piercing deep into the earth. Every rootlet lends itself to steady the growing giant as if in anticipation of fierce conflict with the elements. Sometimes its upward growth seems checked for years, but all the while it has been expending its energy in pushing a root across a large rock to gain a firmer anchorage. Then it shoots proudly aloft again, prepared to defy the hurricane. The gales which sport so rudely with its wide branches find more than their match and only serve still further to toughen every minutest fiber from pith to bark. The acorn planted in the deep forest shoots up a weak splendor sapling. Shielded by its neighbors, it feels no need of spreading its roots far and wide for support. Take two boys as nearly alike as possible, place one in the country away from the hothouse culture and refinements of the city with only the district school, the Sunday school and a few books. Remove wealth and props of every kind 
and if he has the right kind of material in him, he will thrive. Every obstacle overcome lends him the strength for the next conflict. If he falls, he rises with more determination than before. Like a rubber ball, the harder the obstacle he meets, the higher he rebounds. Obstacles and opposition are but apparatus of the gymnasium in which the fibers of his manhood are developed. He compels respect and recognition from those who have ridiculed his poverty. Put the other boy in a Vanderbilt family. Give him French and German nurses. Gratify every wish. Place him under the tutelage of great masters and send him to Harvard. Give him thousands a year for spending money and let him travel extensively. The two meet. The city lad is ashamed of his country brother. The plain, threadbare clothes, hard, hard hands, tawny face, and awkward manner of the country boy make sorry contrast with the genteel appearance of the other. The poor boy bemoans his hard lot, regrets that he has no chance in life, and envies the city youth. He thinks that it is a cruel providence that places such a wide gulf between them. They meet again as men, but how changed! It is as easy to distinguish the sturdy self-made man from the one who has been propped up all his life by wealth, position, and family influence as it is for the shipbuilder to tell the difference between the plank from the rugged mountain oak and one from the sapling of the forest. If you think there is no difference place each plank in the bottom of a ship and test them in a hurricane at sea. When God wants to educate a man, he does not send him to school to the graces, but to the necessities. Through the pit and the dungeon, Joseph came to a throne. We are not conscious of the mighty cravings of our half-divine humanity. We are not aware of the God within us until some chasm yawns which must be filled or till the rending asunder of our affections forces us to become conscious of a need. Paul, in his Roman cell, John Huss led to the stake at Constance, Tyndale dying in his prison at Amsterdam, Milton amid the incipient earthquake throes of revolution, teaching two little boys in Aldgate Street, David Livingstone worn to a shadow, dying but in Central Africa alone, what failures they made all to themselves have seemed to be, yet what mighty purposes was God working out by their apparent humiliations? Two highwaymen, chancing once to pass a gibbet. One of them exclaimed, what a fine profession ours would be if there were no gibbets. Tut, you blockhead, replied the other, gibbets are making of us, for if there were no gibbets, everyone would be a highwayman. Just so, with every art, trade, or pursuit, it is the difficulties that scare and keep out unworthy competitors. Success grows out of struggles to overcome difficulties, says Smiles. If there were no difficulties, there would be no successes. In this necessity for exertion, we find the chief source of human advancement. The advancement of individuals as of nations, it has led to most of the mechanical inventions and improvements of the age. Stick your claws into me, said Mendelssohn to his critics when entering the Birmingham Orchestra. Don't tell me what you like, but what you don't like. John Hunter said the art of surgery would never advance until professional men had the courage to publish their failures as well as their successes. Young men need to be taught not to expect a perfectly smooth and easy way to the objects of their endeavor or ambition, says Dr. Peabody. Seldom does one reach a position with which he has reason to be satisfied without encountering difficulties and what might seem discouragements. But if they are properly met, they are not what they seem and may prove to be helps, not hindrances. There is no more helpful and profiting exercise than surmounting obstacles. It is said that but for the disappointments of Dante, Florence would have had another prosperous Lord Mayor and the ten dumb centuries continued voiceless, and the ten other listening centuries, for there will be ten of them and more, would have had no Divina Commedia to hear. It was in the Madrid jail that Cervantes wrote, Don Quixote. He was so poor that he could not even get paper during the last of his writing and had to write on scraps of leather. 
A rich Spaniard was asked to help him, but the rich man replied, Heaven forbid that his necessities should be relieved. It is his poverty that makes the world rich. A constant struggle, a ceaseless battle to bring success from inhospitable surroundings is the price of all great achievements. She sings well, said a great musician of a promising but passionless cantatrice. But she wants something, and in that something, everything. And if I were single, I would court her. I would marry her. I would maltreat her. I would break her heart. And in six months, she would be the greatest singer in Europe. He has the stuff in him to make a good musician, said Beethoven of Rossini. If he had only been well flogged when a boy. But he is spoiled by the ease with which he composes. We do our best while fighting desperately to attain what the heart covets. Martin Luther did his greatest work and built up his best character while engaged in sharp controversy with the Pope. Later in his life, his wife asks, Doctor, how is it that whilst subject to papacy, we prayed so often and with such fervor, whilst now we pray with the utmost coldness and very seldom? When Lord Eldon was poor, Lord Thurlow withheld a promised commissionership of bankruptcy saying that it was favor not to give it to them. What he meant was, said Eldon, that he had learned I was by nature very indolent, and it was only want that could make me very industrious. Waters says that the struggle to obtain knowledge and to advance oneself in the world strengthens the mind, disciplines the faculties, matures the judgment, promotes self-reliance, and gives one independence of thought and force of character. The gods and bounty work up storms about us, says Addison, that give mankind occasion to exert their hidden strength and throw out into practice virtues that shun the day and lie concealed in the smooth seasons and the calms of life. The hothouse plant may tempt a pampered appetite or shed a languid odor, but the working world gets its food from fields of grain and orchards waving in the sun and free air, from cattle that wrestle on the plains from fishes that struggle with currents of river or ocean, its choicest perfumes from flowers that bloom unheeded, and in wind-tossed forests finds its timber for templates and for ships. I do not see, says Emerson, how any man can afford for the sake of his nerves and his nap to spare any action in which he can partake. It is pearls and rubies to his discourse, drudgery, calamity, exasperation, want are all instructors in eloquence and wisdom. The true scholar grudges every opportunity of action, passed by a loss of power. Kosuth called himself a tempest-tossed soul whose eyes have been sharpened by affliction. Benjamin Franklin ran away and George Law was turned out of doors, thrown upon their own resources. They early acquired the energy and skill to overcome difficulties. As soon as young eagles can fly, the old birds tumble them out and tear the down and feathers from their nest. The rude and rough experience of the eaglet fits him to become the bold king of birds, fierce and expert in pursuing his prey. Boys who are bound out, crowded out, kicked out, usually turn out, while those who do not have these disadvantages frequently fail to come out. It was not the victories, but the defeats of my life which have strengthened me, said the aged Sydenham Points. Almost from the dawn of history, oppression has been the lot of the Hebrews, yet they have given the world its noblest songs, its wisest proverbs, its sweetest music. With them, persecution seems to bring prosperity. They thrive where others would starve. They hold the purse strings of many nations. To them, hardship has been like spring mornings, frosty but kindly, the cold of which will kill the vermin, but will let the plant live. In one of the battles of the Crimea, a cannonball struck inside the fort, crashing through a beautiful garden. But from the ugly chasm, there burst forth a spring of water, which ever afterward flowed a living fountain from the ugly gashes which misfortunes and sorrows make in our hearts, perennial fountains of rich experience and new joys often spring. Don't lament and grieve over lost wealth. The Creator may see something grand and mighty which even He cannot bring out as long as your wealth stands in the way. 
You must throw away the crutches of riches and stand upon your own feet and develop the long unused muscles of manhood. God may see a rough diamond in you, which only the hard hits of poverty can polish. God knows where the richest melodies of our lives are, and what drill and what discipline are necessary to bring them out. The frost, the snows, the tempests, the lightnings are the rough teachers that bring the tiny acorn to the sturdy oak. Fierce winters are as necessary to it as long summers. It is its half-century struggle with the elements of existence, wrestling with the storm, fighting for its life from the moment that it leaves the acorn until it goes into the ship that gives its value. Without this struggle, it would have been characterless, stamina-less, nerveless, and its grain would have never been susceptible of high polish. The most beautiful as well as the strongest woods are found not in tropical climates, but in the severe climates where they have to fight the frosts and the winter's cold. Many a man has never found himself until he has lost his all. Adversity stripped him only to discover him. Obstacles, hardships are the chisel and mallet which shape the strong life into beauty. The rough ledge on the hillside complains of the drill, of the blasting powder which disturbs its piece of centuries. It is not pleasant to be rent with powder, to be hammered and squared by the quarrymen, but look again. Behold the magnificent statue, the monument chiseled into grace and beauty, telling its grand story of valor in the public square for centuries. The statue would have slept in the marble forever but for the blasting, the chiseling, and the polishing. The angel of our higher and nobler selves would remain forever unknown in the rough quarries of our lives, but for the blastings of affliction, the chiseling of obstacles, and the sand papering of a thousand annoyances. Who has not observed the patience, the calm endurance, the sweet loveliness chiseled out of some rough life by the reversal of fortune or by some terrible affliction? How many businessmen have made their greatest strides toward manhood, have developed their greatest virtues when the reverses of fortune have swept away everything they had in the world, when disease had robbed them of all they held dear in life? Often we cannot see the angel in the quarry of our lives, the statue of manhood, until the blasts of misfortune have rent the ledge and difficulties and obstacles have squared and chiseled the granite blocks into grace and beauty. Many a man has been ruined into salvation. The lightning which smote his dearest hopes opened up a new rift in his dark life and gave him glimpses of himself which until then he had never seen. The grave buried his dearest hopes but uncovered possibilities in his nature of patience, endurance, and hope which he never dreamed he possessed before. Adversity is a severe instructor, says Edmund Burke, set over us by one who knows us better than we do ourselves, as he loves us better too. He that wrestles with us strengthens our nerves and sharpens our skill. Our antagonist is our helper. This conflict with difficulty makes us acquainted with our object and compels us to consider it in all its relations. It will not suffer us to be superficial. Men who have the right kind of material in them will assert their personality and rise in spite of a thousand adverse circumstances. You cannot keep them down. Every obstacle seems only to add to their ability to get on. Under certain circumstances, says Castellar, Savonarola would undoubtedly have been a good husband, a tender father, a man unknown to history, utterly powerless to print upon the sands of time and upon the human soul the deep trace which he has left. But misfortune came to visit him, to crush his heart, and to impart that marked melancholy which characterizes a soul in grief, and the grief that circled his brows with a crown of thorns was also that which wreathed them with the splendor of immortality. His hopes were centered in the woman he loved. His life was set upon the possession of her, and when her family finally rejected him, partly on account of his profession and partly on account of his person, he believed that it was death that had come upon him, when in truth it was immortality. The greatest men will ever be those who have risen from the ranks. It is said that there are 10,000 chances to one that genius, talent, and virtue shall issue from a farmhouse rather than from a palace. 
The youth Opie earned his bread by sawing wood, but he reached a professorship in the Royal Academy. When but ten years old, he showed the material he was made of by a beautiful drawing on a shingle. Antonio Canova was the son of a day laborer. Thorwaldson's parents were poor, but like hundreds of others, they did with their might what their hands found to do and ennobled their work. They rose by being greater than their calling, as Arkwright rose above mere barbering, Bunyan above tinkering, Wilson above shoemaking, Lincoln above rail splitting, and Grant above tanning. By being first-class barbers, tinkers, shoemakers, rail splitters, tanners, they acquired the power which enabled them to become great inventors, authors, statesmen, and generals. Adversity exasperates fools, dejects cowards, draws out the faculties of the wise and industrious, puts the modest to the necessity of trying their skill, awes the opulent, and makes the idle industrious. Neither do uninterrupted success and prosperity qualify men for usefulness and happiness. The storms of adversity, like those of the ocean, rouse the faculties and excite the invention prudence, skill, and fortitude of the voyager. The martyrs of ancient times, embracing their minds to outward calamities, acquired a loftiness of purpose and a moral heroism worth a lifetime of softness and security. A man upon whom continuous sunshine falls is like the earth in August. He becomes parched and dry and hard and close-grained. Men have drawn from adversity the elements of greatness if you have the blues, go and see the poorest and sickest families within your knowledge. The darker the setting, the brighter the diamond. Don't run about and tell acquaintances that you have been unfortunate. People do not like to have unfortunate men for acquaintances. Beethoven was almost totally deaf and burdened with sorrow when he produced his greatest works. Schiller wrote his best books in great bodily suffering. He was not free from pain for 15 years. Milton wrote his leading productions when blind, poor, and sick. Who best can suffer, said he, best can do. Bunyan said that if it were lawful, he could even pray for greater trouble for the greater comfort's sake. Do you know what God puts us on our backs for? asked Dr. Payson, smiling as he lay sick in bed. No, replied the visitor, in order that we may look upward. I am not come to condole but to rejoice with you, said the friend, for it seems to me that this is no time for mourning. Well, I am glad to hear that, said Dr. Payson. It is not often I am addressed in such a way. The fact is I never had less need of condolence, and yet everybody persists in offering it. Whereas when I was prosperous and well, and a successful preacher, and really needed condolence, they flattered and congratulated me. A German knight undertook to make an immense Aeolian harp by stretching wires from tower to tower of his castle. When he finished the harp, it was silent. But when the breezes began to blow, it heard faint strains like the murmuring of distant music. At last a tempest arose and swept with fury over his castle, and then rich and grand music came from the wires. Ordinary experiences do not seem to touch some lives, to bring out any poetry any higher manhood. Not until the breath of the plague had blasted a hundred thousand lives and the great fire had licked up cheap, shabby, wicked London did she arise, phoenix-like from her ashes and ruin, a grand and mighty city. True salamanders live best in the furnace of persecution. Every man who makes a fortune has been more than once a bankrupt, if the truth were known, said Albion Torg. Grant's failure as a subaltern made him commander-in-chief, and for myself, my failure to accomplish what I set out to do led me to what I never had aspired to. The appeal for volunteers in the great battle of life in exterminating ignorance and error and planting high on an everlasting foundation the banner of intelligence and right is directed to you. Burst the trammels that impede your progress and cling to hope. Place thy high standard, and with a firm tread and fearlessness, I press steadily onward. Not ease, but effort. Not facility, but difficulty makes men. 
toilsome culture is the price of great success and slow growth of a great character is one of its special necessities. Many of our best poets are cradled into poetry by wrong and learn in suffering what they teach in song. Byron was stung into a determination to go to the top by a scathing criticism of his first book, Hours of Idleness, published when he was but 19 years of age. Macaulay said, there is a scarce an instance in history of a so sudden a rise to so dizzy an eminence as Byron reached. In a few years, he stood by the side of such men as Scott, Southey, and Campbell, and died at 37, that age so fatal to genius. Many an orator like stuttering Jack Curran or orator Mum, as he was once called, has been spurred into eloquence by ridicule and abuse. This is the crutch age. Helps and aids are advertised everywhere. We have institutes, colleges, universities, teachers, books, libraries, newspapers, magazines. Our thinking is done for us. Our problems are all worked out in explanations and keys. Our boys are too often tutored through college with very little study. Short roads and abridged methods are characteristic of the century. Ingenious methods are used everywhere to get the drudgery out of the college course. Newspapers give us our politics and preachers our religion. Self-help and self-reliance are getting old-fashioned. Nature, as if conscious of delayed blessings, has rushed to man's relief with her wondrous forces and undertakes to do the world's drudgery and emancipate him from Eden's curses. But do not misinterpret her edict. She emancipates from the lower only to call to the higher. She does not bid the world to go and play while she does the work. She emancipates the muscles only to employ the brain and heart. The most beautiful as well as the strongest characters are not developed in warm climates where man finds his bread ready made on trees where exertion is a great effort, but rather in a trying climate and on a stubborn soil. It is no chance that returns to Hindu riot a penny and to the American laborer a dollar for his daily toil. That makes Mexico with its mineral wealth poor and New England with its granite and ice rich. It is rugged necessity. It is the struggle to obtain. It is poverty, the priceless spur that develops the stamina of manhood and calls the race out of barbarism labor found the world a wilderness and has made it a garden as the sculptor thinks only of the angel imprisoned in the marble block so nature cares only for the man or woman shut up in the human being the sculptor cares nothing for the block as such nature has little regard for the mere lump of breathing clay the sculptor will chip off all unnecessary material to set free the angel Nature will chip a and pound us remorselessly to bring out our possibilities. She will strip us of wealth, humble our pride, humiliate our ambition, let us down from the ladder of fame, will discipline us in a thousand ways if she can develop a little character. Everything must give way to that. Wealth is nothing. Position is nothing. Fame is nothing. Manhood is everything. Not ease, not pleasure, not happiness, but a man. Nature is after. In every great painting of the masters, there is one idea or figure which stands out boldly beyond everything else. Every other idea or figure on the canvas is subordinate to it, but pointing to the central idea finds its true expression there. So in the vast universe of God, every object of creation is but a guideboard with an index finger pointing to the central figure of the created universe, man. Nature writes this thought upon every leaf, she thunders it in every creation. It is exhaled from every flower, it twinkles in every star. Oh, what price will nature not pay for a man? Ages and aeons were nothing for her to spend in preparing for his coming, or to make his existence possible. She has rifled the centuries for his development and placed the universe at his disposal. The world is but his kindergarten and every created thing but an object lesson from the unseen universe. Nature resorts to a thousand expedients to develop a perfect type of her grandest creation. To do this, she must induce him to fight his way up to his own loaf. She never allows him once to lose sight of the fact that it is the struggle to attain that develops the man. The moment we put our hand upon that which looks so attractive at a distance and which we struggled so hard to reach, nature robs it of its charm by holding up before us another prize still more attractive. Life, 
says a philosopher, refuses to be so adjusted as to eliminate from it all strife and conflict and pain. There are a thousand tasks that in larger interest than ours must be done, whether we want them or not. The world refuses to walk upon tiptoe so that we may be able to sleep. It gets up very early and stays up very late, and all the while there is the conflict of myriads of hammers and saws and axes with the stubborn material that in no other way can be made to serve its use and do its work for man. And then too, these hammers and axes are not wielded without strain or pang, but swung by the millions of toilers who labor with their cries and groans and tears. Nay, our temple building, whether it be for God or man, exacts its bitter toll and fills life with cries and blows. The thousand rivalries of our daily business, the fiercer animosities when we are beaten, the even fiercer exultation when we have beaten the crashing blows of disaster, the piercing scream of defeat, these things we have not yet gotten rid of, nor in this life ever will. Why should we wish to get rid of them? We are here, my brother, to be hewed and hammered and planed in God's quarry and on God's anvil for a nobler life to come. Only the muscle that is used is developed. The constantly cheerful man who survives his blighted hopes and disappointments, who takes them just for what they are, lessons, and perhaps blessings in disguise, is the true hero. There is a strength, deep bedded in our hearts of which we wreck, but little till the shafts of heaven have pierced its fragile dwelling, must not earth be rent before her gems are found? Mrs. Hammonds. If what shone afar so grand turns to ashes in the hand, on again the virtue lies, in the struggle, not the prize. The hero is not fed on sweets, daily his own heart he eats, Chambers of the great are jails, and headwinds right for royal sails. So many great illustrious spirits have conversed with woe, have in her school been taught as are enough to consecrate distress, and I make ambition even wish the frown beyond the smile of fortune, then welcome each rebuff that turns earth's smoothness rough, each sting that bids not sit nor stand but go browning. And that is a rather old description of the power of obstacles in your life. This is one of the earlier books by Orson Sweat Martin. So you'll find that there's a lot of references in here you may not even know of. He is talking from a time before 1900 and he's referring to times in the past. This is not saying that poverty is good and that wealth is bad. It is saying that obstacles can create greater wealth and a greater life. There are people that I've met who have not ever been impoverished, but have seen it on the horizon and worked very hard to avoid it. In my own life, if I had not gone through the struggles that I have been through, I would not understand the contrast and I would not have experienced many of the wonderful things that I have experienced. It's easy to read this and think, oh, I need to have a declaration of poverty or something like that. No, that's not what this is saying. Just think about times. If you were to make a certain amount of money, would you start getting comfortable? Maybe that comfortable aspect of you will stop you from achieving some greatness or helping someone out. I know people personally, once they make that certain amount, they're going to sit at home and watch TV and do nothing. I saw it during the, when COVID was just beginning and I know people and have friends that started receiving $600 in unemployment and they chose to sit at home and do nothing because they thought they were comfortable not looking into the future. I'm not saying that unemployment is bad. I'm just saying that it is part of human nature. Once you're comfortable to not do anything and to be burned in the fire and crafted like a sculpture is what we are in this world. I always refer back to the law of one material, but they say that 
the service to self or the negative aspect or the evil aspect, if you want to call it that, knows very well they can't be too hardcore because then they create the opposite. They create a moment where it motivates people to do the opposite. So if it becomes too authoritarian, then people will fight back and stop the authoritarianism. It's always been that way in the world. And so when you look what's happening in the world, when you see almost cartoonish figures on the world stage, sometimes I just think those are characters that God is playing in his eternal play that will become a catalyst for us to do the opposite in many different ways, in many different things. I know a lot of people are struggling and some of those struggles are helping us to look in the mirror at ourselves and become better at what we do to learn more. All of these things are powerful. And once again, I'm not saying here that wealth is bad. I'm saying that you are greater than what you think. And all things in nature have proven this. That's how nature works. The fires and resistance that occurs is what creates what beautiful things in nature. Everything is working to your advantage. If you're going through a struggle right now, let it become the catalyst. You would literally have a choice right now and you can choose to focus on what's going wrong and then fall into that trap or you can see it for what it is and that is something that can motivate you to become great at something to create something that's wonderful or awesome you might not have the resistance or obstacles that you need and you only make five hundred dollars a month but then when you have the obstacles and you don't ever want to experience that again you make ten thousand dollars a month or twenty thousand dollars a month this driving motivational force is what god is trying to push us to do and that is what this chapter was all about now might not be for everybody i always sometimes find these older writings to be very powerful in their simplicity and i'd like to know what you think Orson Sweat Martin was a man before his time. These writings still speak to me because they speak to human nature. And I'd love to know what you think. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution. <laughs>